Today on Black Twitter Talk, we are talking Kendrick's damn Janet Jackson is not a gold digger and Auntie Maxine. Stay tuned. Send me Thanks for tuning location. in to Black Twitter, y'all. It's a special Easter Sunday episode where we're going to talk about Kendrick Lamar all day. Hey, hey. He is risen. Happy <laughs> Easter. I am your host, Angie Skates. You can find me on Twitter at Angie underscore Skates and on the gram at Big underscore Ange. What's up, you guys? It's your girl, Kels. You already know you can find me on Twitter and the gram at The Urban Gypsy LA. And this is our jam. I've been having this on repeat outside of Kendrick's album. This is Khalid, right? Yes. And this is off of his American Teen album. This is actually the remix, but I love this song. Ooh. (laughs) No, I'm off of Yeah, I don't know what key that is. (laughs) I'm harmonizing. Oh, but Khalid does it better with Kehlani and Lil Wayne on the remix. Uh, Kehlani's on a remix? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I like Kehlani too. Mm -hmm. She she goes in. But um, y'all know, because we've all been waiting for it. Kendrick's album. Damn. Damn! And that's exactly how we <laughs> felt after we heard it. And I still have so much more to get through on this album. I mean, I've heard it from top to bottom, from bottom to top, top to bottom, in the middle, all the way around on the side. You're losing your rings, girl. But it's still so much that I feel like I <laughs> I've un- haven't unearthed. But we're going to... How do you? How did it make you feel? I did, love that First album. of all, did you get through it? Yeah, I got through it. Okay. But I feel like I haven't really sat with it. I feel like with Kendrick's album, it's always all these layers and different meanings and themes and stuff. And I'm still kind of trying to understand exactly what are you trying to tell us, Let's talk about the cover art. What about it? Everybody's going ham about it. Like, <laughs> what, do, what do you think about it? I feel like it's really simple. I think it's very simple, but he's saying so much. He has, like, this really... I don't know. Like, he's in a trance almost. Maybe he just feels depleted from everything that he gave on this this masterpiece. And he's just like, this is how you're going to feel after you hear everything I just gave you. Okay, Damn. I see that. I don't know. I feel like it's hella simple. It's cool, but it's, a lot of people are going in about it like it's, like, the most artistic picture we've ever seen. And it's very simple to me. Well, with the typography, it's kind of reminiscent of the Times magazine, right? And yeah. they juxt- I saw a lot of people on Twitter juxtapose Donald Trump on the cover of Time and then this cover, too. Oh, okay. Then I, I like that. Oh. <laughs> I didn't see that. I also, um, what's the show? Um, when they're moving on up to the east, east side. side. Uh-huh. Weezy, is that the mama from that show? Uh-huh. She was uh, also graced the cover of this. Uh, yeah, I didn't see. You didn't that. see that one. Mm-hmm. That was a good one. Then I heard like you know how you have the people who have the Illuminati theories or whatever. They were talking about the M is positioned right above his head, representing horns and like all these deep, deep, deep meanings. And I'm like, yo, no, bring it, bring it on back. It's a whole theory based on the album cover and I don't know and where how the, he released it, the dates and everything. Yeah, and how there's another album coming called Nation today. Like I'll just be like, bruh, y'all reaching too, too much. Too much. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit about the producers that yes, came together and worked always. on this album. Soundwave, who is from Compton, he has worked on a lot of Kendrick's um, stuff. Terrace Martin uh, produced on this album, too. Mike Will made it. He's one of my faves. James Blake, Cardo, um, Steve Lacey from the Internet Band. This kid is amazing. He produced the track called, I think it's Pride, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he produced this track with sounds that he made from his iPhone. Yeah, the whole album was made off the iPhone. I mean, not the whole album. That whole track was off the I- yeah. album, right? Yeah, because off all of his, off the, his iPhone, because the music that he makes, he makes it from his iPhone. That's dope. It's so dope. I'm so proud of the Internet Band. They're all just, like, right, rightfully reveling in the glory that they should have. Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> But the production on this album was sick. It was crazy. The lyrical content, crazy. The overall thematic messages that Kendrick is given. He talks about religious. He talks about politics. He talks about... Uh, what else did he talk about? Those are the main things that always stand out to me that I'm like always super interested in or super um, intrigued by is the way that he incorporates religion into his albums. Yeah. And again, he did it again, and he <laughs> goes deeper this time than I feel he did the last time. And so that's part part of where I'm like, okay, I need to keep sitting with this because 
you know, religion is pretty deep. <laughs> it is very deep, and I have some comments about that. Uh, but first, I want to talk about uh, the statements that he made about Geraldo Rivera. We all know what a hack that guy is. Um, happy Easter, Geraldo, Geraldo, whatever your name is. Um, anyway, so he's made comments about Kendrick Lamar and how um, his live performance of All Right that he did a couple years ago, he said that hip-hop is more devastating to young black teens or youth in America than actual racism is and that he just doesn't like Kendrick and his message and blah, 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 blah. So Kendrick definitely comes at, G is it Geraldo or Geraldo? Mm -hmm. It depends on where you're from, I guess. <laughs> um, it, he comes at his neck and he basically has whole bars, like just whole verses where he's uh, deconstructing that myth. I think it's interesting that uh, white people always feel that they have the right or the need to assert themselves into certain conversations, asserting things like hip hop is more destructive than actual racism in America when hip hop is a symptom of the racism that we've right, experienced exactly. in America. <laughs> it's an expression it. that we use as an outlet to talk about the kinds of things that we've endured as black people in this country at the hands of racism and chattel slavery of our people. And I just think it's interesting how people are, are often inserting themselves into that conversation as an authoritarian saying this is what it is and this is how like no shut up sit down and that's pretty much what Kendrick did and I'm I'm thankful for that right yeah <laughs> um what else you you said you didn't have enough time to unearth this but I'm gonna go ahead and disagree because you got all these points about it okay well, girl I sat with it and this, these are things <laughs> she lied. That I, I didn't lie these are things <laughs> that came up to me uh -huh. um I think this is Kendrick at his best this is his fourth studio album why do you think it's him at his best because he's always had the lyrical content I feel like he he reaches deep in in the themes and things that he's talked he talks about he's not a politician but he's often talking about politics and things that are that matter to us and I feel like he's his storytelling abilities have gotten progressively better and not to say that they weren't already good but in the song for instance um the last song on the album duckworth i feel like he raps in parables much like that uh, of the rapper nas who i think is the best storyteller in that sense as far as putting a parable um on a hot in a hot 16 you know what i mean <laughs> Um, so, and I think that Kendrick, he, he flexes and he does that very well on this album. And then also the story play, cause I've heard a lot of people say, if you play the album from front to back, it tells the story of Kendrick Lamar. But if you play it from back to front, it tells the story of Kung Fu Kenny. And I just think that the consistency of his storytelling ability, even if you do play the album from front to back, back to front. Well, who was Kung Fu Kenny? Kung like Fu Kenny is like an alter ego. I think that has more to do with, um, uh, him outside of his own, uh, like an outer body yeah, experience. Yeah, where because you know he in in the to pimp a butterfly. Um, I feel like it was a very internal stream of consciousness consciousness that we were witnessing that we were experiencing. And then on this album, Kung Fu Kenny is kind of like the exterior version, the manifestation of everything that he was pondering and you know going through internally in his mind. This is an outer manifestation of it, and I like okay, it. Okay, see, see. <laughs> I hadn't, right. I hadn't gotten that deep yet, so you, now it's like I, I need to go back and listen and I consider asked these you, things. Did you sit with it? No, I'm just kidding. And I told you no. Oh. I said I heard it once oh, or okay. twice. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, I already said what I had to say. Like I already love it. I'm always interested in the religious undertones that are brought up, and I guess I'm super excited about that. Or just overall, how even with him and then with Chance the Rapper, I just love to see how our generation expressed how religion has affected us and how we interpret it because it was fed to us. And now we're at that age and in this part of our life where it's like, okay, we can reconstruct it and define it for ourselves. So I'm, I'm very, I'm always intrigued by how that um, plays out. Yes. The Ooh. thing that it kind of irked me a little bit about this album is the rhetoric that his cousin Carl Duckworth was giving mm -hmm. um, he was saying that you know because we're black we're cursed and because we're poor we're cursed and this that and the other and he was quoting Bible verses in Deuteronomy and this that and he said that we're not black we're Israelites and I just I have a hard time with that because these are ideologies and principles and you know things that I've struggled with uh, in, in religion and I'm definitely not an Israelite <clears throat> definitely black and I definitely <laughs> find Carl Duckworth Duckworth whatever 
really annoying. He really annoyed the crap out of me. Um, but I think it's interesting because I don't necessarily think that Kendrick is um, absorbing or even internalizing the things that Carl is saying about religion, but it has affected him and has shaped him. And I think even uh, on the, uh, what song is it? A couple of songs he talks about it. I think it shows even his struggle with what he will and will not accept as far as what is useful to him. Right. And yeah. that's why I guess it doesn't bother me because, I mean, we have a Carl Duckworth in our family or that you, that you run into or whatever. Like, everybody, a, a lot of people believe in the Bible as a literal... Literally. Um, yeah, as a literal document to say what's going on right now. So, it doesn't bother me. I always feel like with any religion, you take the part that resonates with you and that makes sense to you and that, you know, you just live a morally correct life or whatnot. And so I agree with you in the sense that it doesn't seem like Kendrick's absorbing it and saying and, and putting that in the album as to say like, oh, this is the truth. This is He's what just I saying, do. this is what I heard and then right. this is how I interpret it or this is part of the influence in my life. Like right. I, I'm out here, I'm in the streets, I'm a hood, NIG, and then, but I do have like roots in religion and practicing this. And then also he has the song where he talks about putting all the religions in one room to tell them that none of us are shit and that God is the true God basically like we all trying to basically say one is better than the other and one is more superior and it's like nah ain't none of y'all mean nothing yeah and I think it's interesting that I, he says over and over um, on the song Elements but even you know sound bites throughout the rest of the album ain't nobody praying for me it's like oh Kendrick why Carl, uh, Uncle Carl isn't praying for you like no you don't think so he said his grandma is dead and you know his his mom. <clears throat> oh, he talks about it a lot on fear too. What? Um, just you know, internalizing everything that we are taught about ourselves and our religion and our spirituality and our race and you know how violent and aggressive that really is. Um, I, there's just so much to unearth here and here here unearth in your ear. <laughs> if you haven't heard it, <laughs> you definitely need to get into so it. So, what's your favorite tracks? I think uh, this is Kendrick at his best. I think DNA for me, it just it rocks something. Um, I when I first heard it, I couldn't get past it. I had to play it over and over and over again. Um, but also Ducksworth, Duckworth. <laughs> Ducksworth is that his last name? In I real think life? I don't know. So his dad is <laughs> Kenneth Ducksworth on the album Duckworth, and then his uncle is Carl Duckworth and Kendrick Duckworth. Kendrick Duckworth. Interesting. I don't know. <laughs> Lamar I, must be his middle name. It must be good. <laughs> good for him. Um, because I ain't rocking with the Duckworth. But um, I think I'm still rocking with Be Humble. Like I'm listening to the tracks, and every time Be Humble comes on, once it comes on, I'm like, I think I'm gonna skip it because I've already played it out. But I'm like, nah, and I start rocking to it. And I love Elements. I love, I like Love. I like. Um, it was another one I really like, but I like a lot of them. And I think what I love about Kendrick too, or this album, is that there are there are these deep themes and topics that we're talking about but then there's also tracks that everybody could kind of just vibe to and they don't have to go deep if they don't want to that's and that I west think, coast that's that west coast and, and that's how i feel too and i'm riding in the car listening to it i'll be like yes i'm mm -hmm. so happy i'm from the <laughs> west <laughs> something hey. that i could just sit back and ride out to yeah. i had just got off the plane and i was uh, whipping down the 101 turning on that kendrick i'm like yeah and then when you ride by you hear another car playing <laughs> and you like, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> He does. It's a West Coast thing. I don't expect y'all to understand. <laughs> Unless um, she's from the West. Unless she's from the West. Um, anyway, so Kendrick Lamar. I I have, you know, I'm going to predict number one. Hmm. What do you think? Is he already there? I don't know. Uh, I know Be Humble was pretty high on the charts, but I don't yeah. know about the album. I'm I would, pretty sure, though. I would have to say 500 units um, by the top of the week. It's yeah, easily. Because I've easy. seen people go into Target just to buy a physical, a physical copy. copy. I'm gonna I, get that on I pre ordered mine before yeah. it even came out. And I still got it for free. But I pre ordered it because I'm like, for the love, for the culture. For the culture. You got to do it one time. Speaking yes. of, are we done with Kendrick? For yeah, now? I mean, we can talk about Kendrick now, all day. Y'all probably tired of us. I know. You know how we do. We love us some Kendrick. <laughs> um, Kung Fu Kenny, come through. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Janet Jackson just had a baby. It's Jackson. Just nasty. Yeah. And we're talking about the baby. <laughs> so Janet, okay? Because mm -hmm. we're not nasty. Oh. Not today. Okay. Mm. Anyway, so she just has a baby. And um, the rumors 
are milling about that she's getting a divorce from her husband. Mm -hmm. And apparently the divorce settlement says that she gets $500 million if she was married to him for over five years. So the announcement comes along three months after the birth of their baby, but two months after that five-year mark. And the debate on Twitter is that Janet Jackson, the legend, is a gold digger. Wait, how do you be a gold digger when you already have gold? How you fix <laughs> your mouth to say anything against the Queen Janet when it comes comes to her bread when she's a self-made millionaire, okay? How much she, is she worth? She, her net worth is estimated at $175 million. That's not even considering all of the other things that she has her hands in. You know what I mean? She... I'm just... But I mean, 500 mil, that's that's way more than 175. But they acting like she hurting for money. <laughs> she bang the table. I'm pissed. <laughs> like, why are y'all coming at Janet's head like she is... Uh, she... Uh, she has her own money and she got her own car she got her own, sorry <laughs> independent okay she doesn't need anybody else's money and for you to come at her like she don't have more number ones than you are how old 25 20 however old you are she got more number ones than that okay but my thought is what if she was in the relationship they married three years in she like this shit ain't gonna work nigga you crazy you got me messed up Dude, like I'm gonna stick it out for another two years and two months so I could go ahead and get that check a lot does of does that people, make her a gold digger though no it doesn't make her a gold digger because she was in that relationship they had a prenup because he's a billionaire and this was a deal that they worked out prior to and if she wants to leave five years is in one day after that mark then so what She's a businesswoman, okay? Okay. Okay. Let's let's be clear about that. And then second, um, it ain't none of your business. And then third, he pins a letter saying that we are not getting a divorce. This is a uh, separation, and we will be together forever. He pinned another one where he was basically having her back and saying that he loved her and everything too, right? Yeah, this is the same, same one? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm just like, we don't know what's happening and who really, I don't even care. Like, that's your business, Janet. Do what you need to do. I, I ain't mad at it. I, you know what? I'm not mad at it either. I'm just mad that people are so quick to throw disrespect on her name. Um, and I feel like that they can do that because she's a black woman. If it was any, if it was anybody else, no, nah, I think we would have went after anybody. Who is we? Not we, but who is we? If it was okay, so because she's a black woman, so I'm guessing who is going after her right now? Black man. Black man. If it was a white woman, then a black woman would go after her. <laughs> like, uh, uh-uh. like if it was like a Kardashian and they like took some black man's money, I think we would we would go after her. Somebody's gonna go after somebody in this situation. That's already a self-made millionaire. Yeah, if you like, y'all really concerned after? about how Janet eating? Really? I personally am not, but I'm just saying the the trend of how people attack people on Twitter or whatnot. Yes, yeah, somebody's gonna go after any woman who leaves two months after the prenup. So it's not a black woman thing; it's just a woman. It's thing. It's a woman thing. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll go with that. It's a but woman shit, thing. If a man left a, a a woman two months after and took five hundred mil, I'm going after his ass too. They had a prenup. What's it to you, young oh, blood? No, I feel like that's what he he agreed to it. So, yeah. Hey. Anyway, and you know I hear a lot. I don't have any kids but I hear a lot that after a baby is born into a relationship sometimes that relationship changes and a woman decides that you know what I can't stand this Not man even and I sometimes, don't most deal times the relationship, with this man no more ever. Yeah I hear most times the relationship change because you go from being just the wife to being a mother and then like mother comes first you know to a degree so there it has to be an adjustment and maybe the adjustment wasn't made and i don't feel like she's just gonna leave him because of the money like if she that's left that's how I feel people like are shape, legit shaping the why. narrative because of the money but and no. i doubt it like please get your life okay anyway but she couldn't finish that tour though so maybe she did that's, that that's, check. that's another saying. part i think you know what i think that's why people are really mad because she was like you know what i'm not gonna do this tour because i'm gonna focus on my family and then she has a family and she goes you know what i don't want my husband anymore so i'm just gonna take my baby uh, and i don't be think she here. didn't do the tour because of her family that's i think she, she physically couldn't do it why because she's just too old not even too old i just think she's gone she is older and she's, she's been doing it for such a long time, and you expect a certain. She can't just come out and rock side and to be side. rhythm like nation, can, Janet. 
Because that's what we want. We want Rhythm Nation. If she's not going to come out and give you Rhythm Nation, nobody wants that. Nobody just wants to see Janet sitting in a chair singing. She can't. Because that's not what made her, got her to this point. Janet is where she is because of her theatrical costumes, dancing, all that stuff that she does. If she can't give it that level, and I feel like that's why she canceled the tour. Okay, because her voice is not that strong to just be sitting Mm-mm, in a chair singing. She has a cute little... Baby. Anyway, I can, can take we? Janet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm can, just kidding, Mama can, Janet. You know you I love you. You can take Janet. Hell no. What you mean, vocally? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe on the dance floor. I don't know about vocally though. No, I can't take her on the dance floor either. Fifty year old Janet, you got her. Oh no, I, I respect you, Janet. I ain't gonna take you. <laughs> I was just playing. <laughs> <laughs> we also love you, Janet, over here at Black Twitter Talk. That's uh-huh. my first concert I ever went to. Was her Velvet Rope tour. My first concert was Janet, not Janet Jackson, Michael Jackson. Filler. Yeah, I was too young for that, so I saw Janet. When you I was, was there. I was too young for it, so the first one I could remember was uh-huh. Janet Velvet Rope and Usher Raymond opened for her for his My Way. Oh, Daddy took you, huh? Goodbye, no. next. <laughs> <laughs> that was my day. Yes. <laughs> Damn. Oh, <laughs> we sisters. <laughs> anyway, so I want to talk about Auntie Maxine. Auntie. Auntie Maxine Water. She has been <laughs> a fervent picture. advocate of um, our impeaching POTUS right now because she keeps saying she's not having any of it. She's been attacked by the media, um, by certain right wing media people. And she is back and she's better than ever. And she's saying that this experience with her working with millennials has been the most electrifying and energizing that she's had in a long time. And I just enjoy seeing her out and about. Um, every time I look on Twitter, it's a new viral clip of her. Yeah. Like she had one just recently where she's talking about, we got to get, get his, his ass, ass out. <laughs> and then this picture, too, where she has on the little denim jacket with the rose. At the Mind tax the, march. Yes. And the rose is like a trending look right now, too. It's like a new little trend having the rose on the denim. So, so is the I'm pastel just, pink. All of that. And I'm just like, why are you trending not just in social media, but with your fits, Maxine. Like, I, I just love, love it. it. People are saying that she should run for president in 2020. Nah. I think she's a great congresswoman and that she serves as well there. Yeah, and, but uh, she even, she responded and said that she doesn't want to run, but she's doing what she's doing so that she can help make pave the way for the person who will run. You other know? young people, yeah. millennials, that are being groomed for this office as we get that other fool out yeah. of here. And I'm just inspired because, you know... Just being from America, and I don't know other cultures too, but like ageism is big. Like once you get to a certain age, like how we're even playing Janet, like oh you're fifty, so you can't do your tour no more. I just I just love seeing her. We're and not playing Janet, but go ahead. Not us, but people. People. I'm just I'm loving seeing her in her older age. Like I would have thought she would be trying to chill right now. So to see her coming out and go so hard, and then being bashed by Bill O'Reilly and all this stuff and she come back even better each time it's like okay you give me hope like I can still be fly when I get older (laughs) I want to say we pay um, homage to all of the older women who have paved the way for us not just Auntie Maxine my granny fly too Mm -hmm, you know all all the all the women in the maven in in the civil rights movement and you know that have done the work and I love that she's still alive and yeah. we're able to see it and honor her and appreciate her now because I feel like that would be one of those things years from now after she was passed away. It's like, oh, what about women we've never heard of, unsung or um, hidden figures? Like, no, she she's, a legend she's for sure. already here and we're already able to, like, really support and show love. Yeah. Um, okay, so we all have seen the United Passenger Oh, my goodness. Fiasco. That was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. But what's even more ridiculous is the the post that was uh, recently published in the article in New York Post, I think it was, where they were saying that Asians are model minorities um, because Hmm. Asians are model minorities because they're saying that um, they're not from this country, but they have surpassed uh, levels of wealth that white men have not been able to uh, reach and that you know educationally they're just you know they're this that and the other they're just basically naming all of these good so-called stereotypical attributes of Asian communities of minorities saying what's wrong with other minority groups why haven't they been able to uh, do mm. the same kinds of things wait so the article about 
the man being dragged off the plane turned into being about how Asians are great yeah. and every, all the other minorities are whack. Yeah, and how they face <laughs> all this adversity, how they were enslaved and how they were interned into camps and all this other stuff, but they're still doing great. And I just would have to say that that article is just straight up BS, first and foremost, because um, Asian immigrants came to this country of their own volition, okay? And they're only highlighting um, attributes that are stereotypical. They don't talk about the hustle and the grind and all the other things that they've um, encountered. But African <clears throat> people, we didn't come here Ooh. from our own volition. Am I yelling? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. It's a different. <laughs> we did not come here on our own volition. We were forced. So don't say that Asians are model minorities in comparison to who, us? Like, slow your row. I think that the person who wrote it, his name was like Andrew or somebody. I don't know. Don't anyway, know. they're pitting but people. But then also, too, with Asian, I mean, although most of them or a lot of them have a distinct phenotypical look about them, uh, that's another thing that allows them to kind of merge assimilate and into, assimilate into society because they have straight hair they have like uh complexions and whatnot so that there's certain things that they don't have to like they are still able to benefit from white supremacy whereas we are not yeah in any way shape or form honestly it's easier for them to assimilate if need be i won't say easier because i don't know i am not asian but i'm just saying for th from that perspective it's easier but I don't really give a fuck about what they're doing. That don't have nothing to do with United people dragging, dragging that people man off, off the plane. plane. And I like I'm glad he was Asian though, because I felt like if he were black or something, they'd be like, oh, whatever, fuck him. It <laughs> happened him. before. It happened to a black woman where she was dragged off the plane. And I keep hearing people that are not of color, that are not black, saying, oh, I wish it was me that got dragged off the plane because he mm -hmm. finna get paid. Uh, a black woman did get drug, drug off of a United flight, and she got fined and she got this that and the other i think she may have even gotten some jail time um but she didn't get paid you well, know this, why are you overselling your flights to the point where you need you feel the need to drag the man off like you really couldn't put your flight attendant on another flight you could have bought them flights to go on a different airline you could have not oversold the flight you could have offered the passenger a uh, unturnable away amount of money like but no your answer was to drag him off the plane I hope, and then they lost eight hundred million dollars like over the week uh, in profit because of that incident. Yeah, I'm trying to book a flight yeah. there now. See where the deal is. Seven dollar flights, you know. Um, <laughs> what else is going on on Twitter? Okay, so what's happening today on Twitter? I keep seeing this trending. There's a Cleveland man who is who has executed fourteen people, and um, he is a black man. I believe he's like in his late thirties. He's a big black man. He's and only in his thirties. He's like he's like thirty seven or thirty eight. And he in his photos are his fifties. Well, this I'm this just is saying. just what Twitter has reported. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. uh huh. I hear you. Oh, oh yeah. So anyway, so he's on a shooting rampage and he's shooting innocent people and um he's doing it live on Facebook and and he's recording everything that he's doing and the reasoning for him. Um, executing these innocent people is because his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend and his mother refused to talk to him. This is like the second case that we've had in, in recent, you know, weeks where there are men that are executing innocent people because of the relationships that they have estranged or whatever between women. So the discussion you said on Twitter discussion. that's going on is about black masculinity. Okay, being... so this one black feminist who always has some really strong points about, you know, black toxic black male masculinity, toxic masculinity, brought this point up and, and is using this as an example, which I understand why this would be used in, as an example, but this is still a developing story, sis. So why do you feel like it should be used as an example of black toxic masculinity? Because I think it is. Like, you are justifying you on a shooting rampage because of a mishap that has happened in a relationship with a black woman, two black women in this instance, your lover and your mother. So why is it that and not mental illness? What is the difference? I don't know. What is the difference? Like, is there a difference? I don't know. People are saying that um, the argument is that it is mental illness, but it's not toxic masculinity. And I'm just like, where, well, what are your credentials for you to say that there is a clear distinction between one or the other? And I understand um, how black men can feel attacked by that woman's thread because, you know, I feel like this is still a developing story. He didn't actually kill the woman and the mother that he's in a relationship with or that he has issues with. 
he's killing innocent people. So I think that that this may not be the best way or best example for that, but they're still attacking her like she is the one that you know. So what are they saying to her? I I just don't feel comfortable repeating oh, it. Dear. They're like calling her all kind of dumb bees and. They're coming at her appearance saying, oh, she's this, she's fat, and she's dark-skinned, so she must hate men. Um, she hates men online, but she is still sexual with them offline. Like, they're coming at her neck, and I think that's ridiculous. Um, but f let's talk about the mental illness in the black community, because I don't know that toxic masculinity, the way that we're conditioned to think about the relationship between men and women um, is a difference. I don't know that there is a difference. I think that we are w not well, and a lot of times we can't tell. So, your your immediate reaction was what? The My immediate reaction was mental illness, illness. That to me, to go and kill a group of people that you don't even know, just pull over, like, oh, Live. I'm about to go kill this black man, and, and I'm gonna record it. To me, that just off top, that something is mentally wrong with this man. But then, okay, now he starts shouting out this woman that he's dating and make, blaming her for it. For me, it still sounded like mental illness just because of my own experience with men with mental illness. I'm like, okay, this nigga's crazy. Um, so as far as him attaching it to the woman and blaming her for everything, I guess that could be toxic black masculinity. Yeah, but that definitely is toxic. But I guess I just don't feel... I think lately... As black women, we've been on this rampage against black men, and I feel like like who is we? We as in black Twitter women, oh. uh, black women feminists. I feel like sometimes when one black man does something, then it's like, oh, y'all black men got this big issue. And I'm not saying that it's not an issue in our community. I just feel like it's coming to this point where it's like anytime anybody does something, we're just like dubbing it like, see, this is that same thing we're talking about. And I guess to a degree it is, but that wasn't my initial. I, when, when I first heard about it, I didn't go straight to like, oh, here we go again, another black man feeling entitled to... I kind of did because it reminded me of a black man that feels entitled who kind of mm -hmm. shared space with me in my life at some point. So I understand how that can be perceived and how she took it there. But then I think if it's not that, then why aren't we able to have a healthy conversation and say, you know what, sis, maybe look at it from this perspective and it could be... But if we look at her initial tweet, there I was know. no room for that. Her I initial know. tweet started... Let me, let me I, find I know. It. She, it was black men are toxic, period. Killing sprees in Cleveland, gaslighting on social media, sexual assault, violent shit, y'all need help. So there was no conversation... And opening right and there. I, and that's why I understand. And I just feel like there's no compassion to be had for anybody on social media. And this is supposed to be a safe space. It doesn't much feel like it at all. And I just think that, you know, for I don't even think it's her position to, to call out toxic black male masculinity at every inch in every turn this is the same one that called out yes. Kendrick, like and it's just like son, at some point i feel like black men have to speak up and say look this is what it is this is what we could do this is how we can prevent this blah blah blah, blah. and there are black men on twitter that are doing that but they're being drowned out by stuff like threads this. like that and then like now you're making me think that maybe there is an overlapping between mental illness and the black toxic masculinity or whatever it's called um and maybe that's also where the disconnect is happening as far as like healing it because we're looking at it as two separate things and maybe they are conjoined and maybe there is work that needs to be done on both sides and it's not something that you can just start yelling like it's just that's if we deal with like when you deal with someone with mental illness you can't just be like you're crazy like that does not help the situation so then if we look at it the same way with the black masculinity we can't be like you guys need help y'all are violent like that's not gonna help the situation either so it's kind of like i don't know i feel like we have to start approaching it in a different way in yeah. order for it to be to move anywhere yeah, and i think the twi twitter threads are not necessarily the best place for that because a lot of things are misconstrued and it just ends yeah. up being a fight <laughs> pretty much nobody wants to fight on twitter yeah. what else y'all watching gorilla What's that? Nah. I ain't watching it. You watching it? I ain't it? watching it. Well, why? Why did we bring it up? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Just real quick. It's a new um, sh series on Showtime. Um, it's written and directed or produced by John Ridley, who mm -hmm. did 12 Years a Slave. And it, it talks about uh, the black liberation movement in uh, the UK um, mm -hmm. in the 70s. And but there are no black women in it. It stars Frida Pinto, who is um, an Asian. She's the 
a brown woman. Um, but they're saying that this is a historical, a historical approach to this historical story because mm -hmm. it doesn't, it erases black women. It's and John, annoying. it is really annoying. And this is why we have Twitter rants, you guys. I tried to have your back, <laughs> and then you go do some shit like this, okay? So I get it. There's just so many things <laughs> moving know. around. And John Ridley's point is, I'm in an interracial relationship, so I made the woman of this movie the lead interracial because of the things that blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, to me, if you wanted to make a movie about your interracial relationship then do that do but that. this is a historical piece and it, he's like well if you guys want to make your stories go ahead and do that but this is my story to tell hey, he's doubling down but anyway John really good luck to you sir but I ain't watching it that is true though if you don't like it go create it we are we are we have and been we speaking do. of the underground oh I didn't watch it so <laughs> all, all the people that watch <laughs> underground if you haven't caught up spoiler alert spoiler, spoiler alert Spoiler, y'all need to catch up. I already told y'all last season, Underground is where it's at. They've gotten a lot more viewers. They're back for a second season. If you're not on it, catch up. But Spoiler. Spoiler. Mm. It's not even a full spoiler. Like, I'm not going to tell you the details because there's, we'll there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Well, what and you it took talk a about, really Kales? cool turn. But this last episode, I was really impressed and really, <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed. And, um, Stunned because the entire episode, what? The entire episode was a monologue from Harriet Tubman. Uh, that's why people kept saying Aisha Hines did the damn thing on that last episode. It was a monologue, the full episode. And I think maybe a couple of characters said a couple things, but she was talking to the white abolitionist. And she's telling her whole story and telling him where she was. So it was really interesting seeing huh. her t basically explain to the white abolitionists about what the movement really is from her perspective and explaining her story and kind of teaching them. And Is that why everybody was talking about how Harriet Tubman's husband was trash on Twitter this week? Maybe. <laughs> I'm like, how are y'all doing Oh, yeah, 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 because she talks about her husband. Like, she ran away. She went back to go get him, and he got married again. Yeah. He was married, and he didn't want to go, I don't think, if she was pissed. There's a... No, no, no. I read something a little bit different, and I don't know how um, historically accurate uh, the, the, um, the underground is, but I read people, like, bashing her husband on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure yeah, probably she went back to go that. get him, and he had remarried. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. so then she felt like, what is she doing it for? And then at that moment, according to the underground, is when she realized it was bigger than just going back to get her family. She started helping everybody. And the character playing her, I'm just like, Aisha oh my Hines. gosh. That's what her name uh -huh. is? Aisha. I want to know. I thought when you said Aisha Hines, I thought maybe it was the writer. No, it's the look, the Man. actor that plays If her. I was in theater right now, I would be doing that monologue <laughs> for every... <laughs> All the little brown babies who yes. I audition on a regular basis, if you're looking for monologues. Deb no, real talk. It no, was really real. good. And I just... I I'm just impressed. No, seriously. And I'm just impressed overall by the underground and the fact that they took that time because I wasn't even sure when I first started if they were going to introduce her as a character. And then when they did, I was nervous that it was going to come off corny because it's like, who is who is Harriet Tubman? Like, what does she look like and really feel like? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to see them do it and I'm like... And do it well? Yes. Look, it's amazing. You getting all emo over there? No, I really am. It's so good. So I'm like, you guys have to catch up. I don't know why Why this is not a show that we're all caught up on. I don't know, but you talked about it a lot for the first season, and I didn't catch on until the very end, and I know I need to catch up. Yes, because a lot but of I things have changed. Okay. The characters are in completely different places, and it's it's so much. It's so much, you guys. Okay, we're going to watch it. You don't got to be black to watch it, y'all. Everybody needs to watch it. It's really good. Okay, I think that's it for today, y'all. <laughs> On this special Easter edition of Black Twitter Talk, yes. thank you for joining us. We will catch y'all next time. I'm your host, Angie Skates. Find me on Twitter at Angie underscore Skates and on the Grand Mad Big underscore Angie. And I'm your girl, Kels. Find me on Twitter in the, uh, in the Gram <laughs> at The Urban Gypsy LA. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>
Hollywood Redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.